Welcome, everyone, to the Metrics International Forum. The forum is organized by the Meta Research Innovation Center at Stanford, or Metrics for short. Uh, the center is directed by John Ioannidis and Steve Goodman, and we are a research group and fellowship program dedicated to finding ways to improve the validity and transparency of scientific research. I'm Lina Koppel. I'm a visiting postdoc at Metrics, and I will be today's moderator. All of the forums are recorded and can be accessed on our website. Um, please mute yourself during the talk and keep your questions until the end, or you can also write them in the chat. Our presenter today is Alexander Goldberg. Alex is the fourth year PhD student in computer science at Carnegie Mellon University. His research focuses on methods to improve decision making from uh, distributed human evaluations with a particular focus on scientific peer review. And in particular, his work uh, leverages AI and statistical tool tools uh, to enhance the, the quality and fairness of uh, review processes and uh, develops methods for privacy pre preserving uh, data sharing, which uh, can enable uh, more transparency into uh, review processes. Uh, while preserving uh, participant anonymity. Uh, Alex is the uh, recipient of an NSF uh, Graduate Research Fellowship. So if you're ready, Alex, uh, please, uh, we can start. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Uh, so today I'll be talking about some work on testing the use of new AI tools, so large language models in the scientific review process. Um, and I'll be describing an experiment that we ran uh, at one specific uh, peer review venue where we deployed LLMs uh, and saw how authors felt about their use. Uh, and I'll mention this little cartoon in the corner I actually made this morning with the help of AI. Both the caption and the image were AI generated. So certainly is the case that uh, AI can help in preparing talk slides um, and potentially help in many tasks within the scientific process. And this is joint work. Um, with a bunch of great collaborators uh, that I've listed here. Okay, so the motivation for this work is that large language models seem to be a promising tool to scrutinize scientific manuscripts and identify possible weaknesses or inaccuracies. Um, however, we know that there's some risks to deploying LLMs. For example, they can hallucinate, which means they can make up facts, um, uh, sorry, evidence that seems factual that's not in fact real. But there's already quite a bit of evidence that LLMs are being used extensively in the peer review of scientific papers. So a number of um, recent papers have tried to estimate the prevalence of the use of LLMs. And they found in a number of large uh, machine learning venues that between seven to 17% of reviews of papers are probably being generated by large language models. So for example, this is uh, one diagram from uh, what, the second paper, Latona et al. And uh, GP, ChatGPT launched November, 2022. So roughly two years from uh, today. And you can see that starting in 2024, uh, reviews had a huge jump up in the estimate in their estimated percentage of AI assisted reviews. So this motivates the question, what are appropriate and effective use cases for large language models in the review of scientific papers? And there actually is an existing history of AI being used in peer review already. So the first task where AI has been used for a while now is in assigning reviewers to papers. So there's a number of freely available computational tools to do this. Generally, they work by trying to compute some similarity score between reviewers based on the reviewer's past publication history and papers or grant proposals that that reviewer is supposed to review in a peer review process. So th these such tools have been used for over a decade in computer science already. And they generally have strong performance. So some recent work has shown that um, switching to using these sorts of uh, of reviewer AI AI based reviewer assignment algorithms in the context of uh, assigning reviewers at the Alma telescope, so a, a non computer science application, um, led to uh, reviewers feeling they had much more expertise in the papers that they were reviewing. 
A second existing use of AI in peer review is in detecting fraudulent behaviors. So in particular, AI can help find examples of plagiarism in papers and also um, help find examples where images were manipulated in the paper. A third use of AI, and one that I will discuss much more in the rest of this talk, is in verifying so-called author checklists. So in these cases, people have tried using LLMs to check whether papers adhere to specific publication guidelines, for example, in reporting experimental results. And there's two exploratory studies out so far to my knowledge that suggest that LLMs could have high accuracy on this task, both in computer science and in medicine. These studies take existing papers and basically manually evaluate whether LLMs could check that these papers met certain standards that exist in checklists um, that state basic uh, uh, aspects of scientific rigor that these papers have to meet. And finally, one question uh, that people have been asking, I think since the advent of ChatGPT two years ago, is could we use uh, large language models for fully automated review? And there's a number of studies out that look at this, basically trying to take a paper and generate an entire review that mocks what a human would do in the review process. And they then evaluate whether these reviews were good or not using some subjective human evaluations. So for example, by asking authors of the paper whether the review was good or not. And one problem with this sort of study is that this evaluation of uh, whether the reviews were good or not is known to be fraught with human biases. So for example, there's biases when uh, evaluating review quality towards longer reviews, and LLMs generally are very good at generating long uh, amounts of text and towards more positive reviews if an author is reviewing reviews on their own paper. So in our work, we conduct a study in the wild at a large machine learning conference, that's NeurIPS 2024, to evaluate the efficacy of LLMs at a relatively clear cut task and also a low risk use case. So we look at the task of evaluating the correctness of completed author checklists before authors submitted to the conference with results shown only to authors. And I'll note that in computer science, conferences are a highly competitive venue for publication. They're one of the primary venues to publish. And these conferences review the entire paper manuscript, not just an abstract. And NeurIPS in particular is one of the largest. Many of the current big breakthroughs in AI, for example, the transformer architecture that powers GPT were originally published at NeurIPS. This year in 2024, it received 15,000 papers. So it's a huge conference. And there's a lot of interest in using AI tools to help improve uh, both the scalability and the quality of reviews at this conference. So this is the first, to our knowledge, study that evaluates the efficacy of LLMs in an actual conference setting for peer review. So let me briefly describe what was on this NeurIPS author checklist that we use LLMs to review. The author, the, the author paper checklist asks authors to verify that their paper manuscript meets certain scientific uh, standards. And at NeurIPS 2024, there were 15 questions that authors were required to answer. I'll show you two examples of such questions. Um, one was asking about experimental compute resources. So in computer science, we generally run experiments that require a bunch of computation. And this question asks whether you've reported in your paper the nature of these computational resources, basically for reproducibility purposes. A second example is a limitations question. So this asks whether authors have a separate limitations section or at the very least discuss the limitations of their work. So as you can see, these are fairly well-defined questions that basically lay out the, the minimum standard that papers should meet to be scientifically rigorous. And authors have to respond to these questions and provide some short justification. For example, I note compute resources in section five of my paper. So we designed a fairly simple tool to uh, verify whether authors had filled out their checklists correctly. This tool prompts GPT-4 with each checklist question and uh, the author's response to that question, as well as their complete paper. 
And the LLM responds with a score of either needs improvement or no concerns about each of the questions on the checklist, as well as a text review of areas that they could improve in the paper or in the checklist to meet the requirements if it, if it needed improvement. And we deployed this tool in May of this year to authors in the week before the submission deadline. So the idea is that when they're going to submit their papers, they can first check with this tool and they could opt in to use it and then make any changes to their paper or checklist and then submit to the conference. But reviewers were not able to use this tool. So to show you what this sort of uh, checklist response and LLM evaluation would look like, um, here's an example. So there's a question on the checklist that asks about theoretical results in the context of computer science. That means basically math, mathematical proofs. And it asks, does the paper provide a full set of assumptions and a complete proof for each theoretical result? This author provided the answer no, and their justification was there was no theory in the paper. And the checklist said, okay, that's valid based on the paper and your answer. I agree that there wasn't theory. The second question asks about whether the author had uh, appropriately credited creators of various assets in the paper. And the author had answered yes. And the checklist says that this answer needs improvement, improvement because there appears to be some discrepancy. So we deployed this to authors and we wanted to answer two main research questions about whether it was helpful. The first was about author perception. So whether authors felt that the LLM based checklist review was valuable. And the second was whether we were able to show that the LLM actually meaning the, the review based on the LLM actually helped authors meaningfully improve their paper submissions in some concrete ways. So let's start by looking at how authors actually used this checklist assistant. Um, so we received 234 submissions to the assistant for verification. And first I'll show you how authors responded to the checklist that they filled out. So they could answer either yes, no, not apl applicable or to do for each question on the checklist. There were 15 questions on the checklist. Those are shown on the x-axis in this plot. And on the y-axis, I'll show the proportion of author responses for each of these questions um, based on these various responses. So what you can see is that mo for most questions, the most common answer is yes, which is kind of what we would hope um, because we want authors to have completed these things in their papers and then submitted papers that met these uh, various criteria. For a couple of questions, for example, there's a human subjects question, the second to last one here, um, that asks whether you had a human subject study and showed that you had IRB approval. For questions like that, um, a lot of authors say not applicable. And then there's also a couple of questions like error bars where authors answered no. There's some cases where they say, for example, it was too expensive to produce error bars, so they just don't have error bars for all of their plots and they're honest about that. Um, and now we can see how the LLM evaluated these responses. So I'll show you um, how often the LLM responded either could be improved or no concerns for each question. Again, we have the 15 questions on the x-axis and the proportion of LLM responses either could be improved or no concerns for each question on the y-axis. And interestingly, the LLM found improvements for a large number of these questions in the vast majority of the time. Uh, the main, the most frequent time when it answers no concerns is in response to NA responses on some of these fairly clear-cut questions to uh, answer as NA. So human subjects, um, a question about whether your paper had broad societal risks and a question about whether you showed proofs for theory, which it's possible to have not applicable to your paper if you didn't have theory. So now, now let's look at some of the types of feedback that uh, the LLM gave. So we had these 236 uh, submissions and for each one, 15 uh, reviews by the LLM for each question. Um, so we then used another LLM to try to cluster and summarize uh, the feedback that the LLM had given when it says people need improvement. So I'll show you some of the types of feedback that we identified um, for four different questions. The first question is a question about claims. It asks whether authors uh, accurately described the main claims of the paper in their abstract and introduction. And the LLM gave feedback 
The most common type of feedback it gave was that authors should clarify the novelty of their contributions. Um, the second category was this comprehensive abstract and introduction enhancement, which included things like making sure the two matched, um, including the right, improving the writing quality. The third uh, category was real world applicability and generalizability of the results. Uh, and the fourth uh, issue that it identified was that people should link the theoretical and, emp and empirical evidence within papers. A second question was on limitations. Um, so here again, there was a first, the, the most common type of feedback it gave was a fairly generic category of feedback that said um, authors should just say more about limitations in future work. But then it had some specific concrete things. For example, um, it should discuss issues of empirical and technical robustness or discuss um, method methodological transparency more. Um, on a more concrete question, a question that asked about whether they had given enough experimental setting, settings and details to reproduce the results. Um, again, there's this pattern that the LLM tends to give somewhat generic results to uh, generic answers on many papers. But in addition to that generic feedback, it does give some more specific uh, points of feedback on things like clarity and organization of the results and ethical considerations. And uh, finally, on a compute resources question, um, it again was able to point to a number of specific concrete areas like discussing the execution time of your algorithms. This is a computer science uh, 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 conference, so that's a big uh, issue and um, improving enhanced reproducibility. So the LLM was capable of giving concrete feedback on how to better meet checklist criteria. And then we conducted a survey with authors to try to understand whether they felt the feedback from the LLM was actually useful or not. So we actually conducted two surveys. The first survey was administered to authors when they registered to our study. And so all authors had to respond to this survey. And we asked four questions in this pre-usage survey, whether they felt that LLM feedback would lead them to modify their paper, whether they expected it to be accurate, whether they thought it would include useful suggestions, and whether they're excited about using LLMs in the paper submission process. We then asked a survey after authors had used the tool, which maps to the same four questions we asked before about their expectations, but about the actual, but, but now asks about their actual usage. So we asked them whether the feedback they received would lead them to modify their paper, whether it was accurate, useful, and encouraged them to use LLMs in the future. And we also solicited some free form feedback from them um, on whether they plan to make any changes due to the feedback they received, and also just describing any issues they experienced with accuracy or usability. Now, the post usage survey, we weren't able to make mandatory because people could use the tool and then just choose not to uh, respond to the survey. So we have some drop off uh, in terms of how many people actually responded to that. So now I'll present the results of this survey. So we had 63 authors out of these 234 submissions who responded to the checklist, uh, sorry, to the survey after using the tool. And so I'll show you um, the proportion of positive responses to our survey on the y-axis for each of these four questions. First, we can see uh, in terms of this pre-usage survey what authors' expectations were. And so before using the tool, authors had very positive expectations um, on all of these questions. Then we can see what happens after using the tool. So maybe the first thing to observe is that expectations were higher than reality. Um, their uh, proportion of positive responses went down on these questions after using the tool. However, they were still majority positive, especially on the questions, will they modify their, their uh, checklist or paper after using the tool, and did they find it useful? Um, we see that authors uh, had over 70% of them found it useful and reported, uh, so, so reported a positive experience using the checklist assistant. And the question with the worst responses afterwards is accuracy. Um, and we see when we look at free form feedback now on what sorts of issues that authors reported when using checklist verification, we got 52 uh, responses. And the most common issue that they uh, said was that the checklist assistant was inaccurate. The second most common issue, which maybe is a different form of inaccuracy, depending on how you think of it, is that it was too strict. And then there was a tale of smaller issues. Um, so one was that 
they felt that the page limits of the conference meant that they couldn't meet some of the criteria that were laid out in the checklist. So they actually felt they were getting useful feedback, but they couldn't um, respond to that feedback because the page limits were too short. NeurIPS, I think, has a 10 or 12 page limit uh, at, at, for conference submissions and a, a number of other uh, specific complaints. Then we wanted to look at whether this checklist assistant actually assisted authors in making any concrete changes to their papers. And so to evaluate this, um, we looked at cases where authors submitted to our checklist assistant multiple times. So there were 40 times when an author uh, submitted more than once to our checklist. And we compare how long their justifications in their checklist were on the first submission versus the second submission. So what I'll show you here on the x-axis is the ratio in the length of the response between the second submission and the first submission. So a longer number here means, for example, a two means that they doubled the length of their response. And uh, it's going to be a cumulative distribution function, so the proportion of responses that were above, sorry, a, a, CCDS so the proportion of responses above each of those. And so if you look at this black line at 0.5, what this plot shows is that over half of all uh, cases where authors changed their justifications, they more than doubled the length of their justification after seeing feedback from the large language model. So of course, there could be many reasons that they change their uh, responses. Um, on the checklist, but this gives us some evidence that authors were able to take the feedback and make meaningful changes. Now, you might ask, could we have used this checklist assistant in a more aggressive way? So let's say automate reviews more fully or to even desk reject papers from a conference if they didn't meet these standards. And one issue that might arise with this form of automation is that it creates incentives to pass the review system with minimal effort. So there's actually a number of examples already in peer review where authors have engaged in adversarial behavior. For example, they've colluded to get more lenient reviewers or reviewers who they know will give them positive reviews on their papers. And so if there were such an automated review process, you might think it, it, it seems quite plausible that uh, authors would want to somehow kind of manipulate what they put on a checklist to get past this review without, say, putting in the effort to put error bars on all of their figures. So we want to ask the question, could authors automatically improve their checklist responses from the checklist assistant with the help of an auxiliary artificial intelligence without making any, any actual changes to their paper? And this would suggest that they could submit the same paper, not do the work of making the paper better, but just use some additional large language model to change their checklist such that they could get past or circumvent the automated review. And we'll run the, we ran the following experiment. For our checklist assistant, we run a paper through the LLM checklist assistant multiple times. We gave it three iterations because that's how many um, times that an author could actually use our tool. And after each time it received feedback from the checklist assistant, we asked another LLM to change the justifications given on the author's checklist based on that feedback without actually changing the paper content in any way. So success in doing this, uh, in getting the LLM um, to so, so success here would mean that the LLM checklist assistant views your modified justifications as better than the original ones, even though you didn't change the paper at all. So here I'll show you the results of this uh, experiment. And we have the 15 checklist questions on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we have the LLM score, which means the proportion of times it said that the um, the answer was acceptable. So this is the so so a higher score here means that the LLM felt that the checklist answers were acceptable more of the time. 
And the red bars on the left show the original justifications given by authors on the 234 submissions we received, while the blue bars show the best uh, performance after asking another LLM to modify your justifications based on feedback that you had gotten from the checklist assistant. And what we see is that for 14 of the 15 questions, the checklist assistant scores checklists more favorably after adversarially modifying justifications, even though no changes were made to the paper. And we actually looked at some of these examples manually and saw that the auxiliary LLM had done things that are kind of unacceptable and clearly did not improve the quality of the paper. For example, the checklist assistant said that a paper did not meet reproducibility standards because it didn't provide access to the code that the, paper, that the original paper had run. And in a modified checklist, the uh, new checklist, the adversarial checklist, just gave a fake link. And the LLM said that that was fine. And a different example, um, the adversarial attack added a description of hardware that had been used to run the experiment that wasn't even in the original paper manuscript. And the checklist assistant deemed that acceptable. So these are cases where the author was able to get an, get the LLM review to say that the paper was acceptable by just changing content on a checklist without having actually provided the necessary standards that were in the that, that the original paper needed to meet. Okay, so to summarize some of the main takeaways from this experiment. On the positive side, authors reported that LLM-assisted checklist review was a valuable enhancement to the paper submission process. We saw in our survey results that the majority of authors found it useful and said that it would help them make meaningful changes to their papers. And we find qualitative evidence that the checklist review helped authors to concretely improve their submissions. So we saw, for example, that when they submitted multiple times, they tended to lengthen their justifications on the checklists. And we saw that the checklist review gave concrete and actionable items that they could change in response to each of the questions. So these both suggest that LLM-assisted checklist review in computer science or potentially in many other fields that use checklists as part of the submission process could be quite valuable as an assistant to authors. On the downsides, we find that there's still issues with accuracy of the LLM. So this was the biggest complaint from authors and also the lowest uh, rating of their survey responses. And there seems to be a gap in expectations versus reality of how well the LLM works. It's possible that some of these issues can be mitigated by more engineering of a system. We had a very simple solution to do this checklist review, but the simple uh, prompting of an LLM to try to solve checklist review had these kind of significant issues. And we find that the system might be vulnerable to gaming, in particular, if authors have an incentive to uh, pass the review. And so this might compromise its utility as a fully automated tool for screening papers because authors could essentially circumvent the automation. And that brings me to the end of my content. So I guess we can begin discussion. I'm happy to take questions.